SMEs are the bedrock of any economy, and that is also the case with Nigeria, with over 35 million um, micro, small, and medium enterprises, which are currently, like I said, the bedrock of the Nigerian economy. But how are these MSMEs, uh, you know, staying afloat during the current harsh economic times? I have joining me now an entrepreneur, and who is someone who has, you know, delved into diverse um, businesses, and she is in the best position to talk about this and how, you know, business can stay afloat during the current economic uh, conditions. I'm joined now by Dorothy Nuhua Kenova. Thank you for joining us on Business Daily. Thank you for having me this morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, let us just start off by, you know, com a, co a conversation around how the current business climate in Nigeria is, talking about the high cost of living, the high cost of production, and just how businesses are currently surviving. From your own lens, how would you say, or what would you say describes the current business environment within Nigeria right now? It's a very difficult situation for small, medium-scale enterprises especially, there is uh, no day that one goes to the market for restocking that one finds the prices they found yesterday. Every time anyone enters the market, what they are told is better by now, if you go come back for evening, price fee don't change. So we have a situation where the entire country has its eye fixed on the dollar naira fluctuation. And that is dictating the kind of market prices that we are all experiencing. It's excruciating, it's uh, confusing, and no adult wants such instability in their economic life. It would be best if you could plan from your house and then you get to the shops and find things the way you planned. But when you plan and you get there and everything is different, then it causes instability, it causes, you know, personal insecurity, because people don't just know what to expect. We can't plan like that. Mm, I understand, especially in the area of, you know, planning around your business. But you are also one who, you know, runs a successful business within the Nigerian business climate. So I would like for you to speak, you know, from your own personal experience. Are there any form of, you know, shock absorbers or how are you personally, you know, uh, going through this tumultuous period? Uh, let me start with the cement shop, for example. The cement shop is located in Diko, that's uh, like 35 kilometers away from Abuja, the federal capital. Um, it, the last time we needed to get a truck of cement, there was need to pull resources from other small scale businesses that we have to augment the money that we had to be able to get the truck load of cement even then we couldn't meet up with the truck load so we had to take half i think this is the time where people have to be flexible people have to think fast on their feet we it seems to have lost our guests right there. But while we wait to have a join us again, I'd just like to point out that uh, the current business climate in Nigeria is obviously, like like she rightly pointed out, you know, struggling, especially with you know high high inflationary pressures that has been faced in recent times. And last I checked, inflation had hit as high as 29.5 percent, according to data from the National Bureau of Statistics. That in the last you month, that is the uh, month. Of January of uh, 2023, Nigeria's inflation has hit 29.5%, um, you know, with increases that one can get basic commodities such as then bread, it is not agriculture, going to be transportation, to and survive. the likes. And while we await, um, while we await our guest, oh, I believe she is back with us. I still have my guest, sure. Dorothy Nuhu, who are kind mm. of with us. Uh, can you go on with your thoughts, ma'am? You were talking about um, issues around, you know, your personal experiences and how much you had to pay to transfer your produce from one point to another. Can you go on, please? Yes, and it has to do with the support systems that people have in place. The savings that one has kept aside over the years 
that is what has been coming in handy at this point it is very important to belong to one form of association or, or cooperative because those are the spaces where one can obtain soft loans from to augment for the capital that they have to invest we're in a situation where now i want to get anything from the market i can't get it at the price at which i got it before so the capital isn't to work and it's inadequate and so it's important to have a pot into which one can dip their hands just like we have in order to survive and it's good to also have people other business partners that uh, you know we can lend help to one another when the capital is short we can get a soft loan to complete the amount of money we need for restocking indeed i'd like for us to speak to issues around the rights policies being put in place because from all we have said it still brings us back to you know macroeconomic issues you know addressing these issues yeah. from the monetary side from the fiscal side of government as well but there has been some a number of policies that have been put in place and one of those like we know is the free float of the naira which started which i should say you know led to the undervaluing of the nigerian naira as we speak but let us hear from you um are you seeing the right policies being put in place to address or to leave or help msmes in this current time from your own point of view you know i think that uh, single uh, or vertical policies will not work in this instance because everything is interlinked uh, we have security issues that are affecting investments we have uh, you know um, the problem of dollar naira fluctuations that are ongoing and so if we're going to have policies that are vertical or you know horizontal policies horizontal policies will not respond to the problems that we have right now we need vertical policies policies that will address diverse issues along the spectrum such that we are able to sort issues that are intersectional in nature and that is the only way we'll get to see some kind of respite we've seen also um you know policies about uh, not allowing uh goods to move in large quantities from some states you know to some others you know people who are holding we don't have policies that we are implementing in those regards to make sure that the market is flooded with the products that we have harvested from our farms and so holders are not helping matters they are driving things up our policy regarding electricity production needs to also be addressed because for as long as SMEs do not have access to regular power supply, you know, it's going to continue to be a challenge. And so policies may have been articulated, but single policies on their own are not going to uh, give us the kind of respite and as quickly as we need it. There is need to have other policies in the area of power in the area of uh, supply of raw materials you know and addressing issues of hoarding in a positive manner and uh, also addressing the border issues and uh, import licenses you know addressing uh, issues that have to do with opening of the market and uh, eliminating monopoly in business and then vigorous implementation and monitoring of those uh, implementation of policies. That's the only way we can see some respite in quick, you know, uh, in quick time. Right now, everybody is complaining because it's just been excruciating. Okay, you have spoken about, you know, having, you know, uh, close monitoring in the area of supply chain, in the area of electricity, as well as, you know, transportation and export and import procedures. But let's speak specifically about okay. uh, supplies, like you have rightly pointed, and even agriculture, and uh, how much of mm -hmm. an impact, you know, security has within those sectors. And we have seen cases of farmers who are unwilling and afraid to go to their farms in this point in time mm -hmm. to address the issue of mm -hmm. agriculture uh, as someone who is like i said a business person within nigeria 
how would you say the government, what immediate actions would you say the government took to address the issue of agriculture and, and, and the fact that, like I stated, farmers are afraid to, you know, go to their farms and there are conversations around Nigeria and, you know, food insecurity, which is current, currently being faced in some areas of the country. But I'd like to hear from you, how can these problems be addressed? What are the low hanging fruit solutions from your own view? I think that, uh, you know, people have talked about kinetic, non-kinetic approaches to this insecurity. I think that the insurgents and bandits or terrorists, you know, have had access to milking the nation of resources to such a point that they have militarized and, you know, equipped themselves very well. And uh, we haven't matched up for diverse reasons. We have heard about corruption within our law enforcement agencies where money is allocated for purchases of weaponry and that is not uh, being done. We also haven't seen any instances where people have been arrested and prosecuted and sentenced, you know, successfully. We, of course, hear rumors about this bandit being liquidated, the other one being, you know, we haven't felt much impact as far as uh, government intervention, law enforcement intervention is concerned, enough to give the farmers the required confidence to go into the farms. When the FCT was coming under attack, we saw in two weeks when uh, indigenous and other residents went into the roads to protest that the minister of the FCT moved into action and promptly, you know, some visible uh, impact was seen in terms of how the security challenge was addressed. We need that to happen all along the states that I was hit because that is where the farming is happening. Benue prides itself as the food basket. Niger State, which is the power state, you know, has all sorts of dams that could serve as opportunities, you know, for irrigation, dry season farming. Um, we also have arable lands within the space. Kaduna, and uh, we need to see military doing more. We need to also build the confidence and trust in the farmers. It is very disheartening to remember that those who were arrested, we only heard about the fact that they repented and they were kind of rehabilitated, but they thrown into our security apparatus. How do we start to trust that kind of security? And many times farmers are complaining that when the attacks are happening, the phone calls are not you know, being heeded to. They make calls to the police, they make calls to the military checkpoint, and they don't see immediate response until the bandits have come, operated for hours, and gone. And then we treat these people as though they were air. They come in in large numbers, armed with vehicles, they move away with hostages, yet they are not traceable. You know, we need to build trust. And the only way to build trust is to not make this whole thing look as mysterious as it is looking. If anybody walks into the community and they are up to a hundred and they are, you know, riding motorbikes, it is possible to trace them. Why can we not do that? Why can't we see images like we are seeing, for instance, in the uh, Israeli Hamas war? We are seeing images. And when the pressure was on, bring back those hostages alive, bring them back immediately. You know, we are not hearing that kind of upset regularly as we used to, because they are being paid information real time. Can we begin to see that happen in Nigeria? Can we equip our security system with monitoring uh, gadgets, you know, modern technologies to give us an idea of what they are doing? Because farmers are at risk. There is no way to get them back to France if they know that they are not going to be back home. 
well said, Dorothy Nuhu. Thank you for your insight on the topic, and especially in the area of you know bridging the trust deficit gap that is currently being faced, you know, between the government, the people, the government, business owners within Nigeria. Thank you again for your insight. Thank you very much for having given me the opportunity. Thank you. And this is the point where we say our goodbyes on today's edition of Business Daily. What a week we have had. And this is the final edition for the week. But Business Daily will be with you again on Monday by 11 o'clock as usual. We will be here to, you know, break down the numbers and give you insight and trends within the Nigerian business space and the global economy. So do well to join us. But in the meantime, join the conversation on social media. Let us hear your thoughts on how you are coping and running a successful small business within Nigeria. My name is Chiamaka Nendu. Thank you for watching and bye for now.